learn to use 3JS shaders. By the end of this tutorial, you should have a pretty good idea of what shaders are and how you can write your own in 3JS. So if you're unfamiliar with shaders, I'm just going to go over a bunch of terms real quick. Feel free to skip ahead if you just want to know how to do this in 3JS. So shaders, they're these tiny fragments of code that run on the GPU. And they're pretty neat because you can use them to do pretty extensive modifications to the mesh or the final color. Now there's basically two types of shaders supported in 3JS, those being vertex shaders and fragment shaders. Quick reminder, make sure you're subscribed so that you get more content like this in the future. Back to shaders. So the way they work is, let's say this is the screen. So I'll draw this rectangular area and that's the screen. And I want to draw this triangle on the screen. Well, a triangle is made of three vertices, and then there's the actual pixels that appear on the screen as a result. Each of these vertices, we run a small program called a vertex shader, and that's responsible for doing basic stuff like transforming the vertex from world space to screen space, as well as passing along anything like texture coordinates to the pixel. At each pixel, we run another separate program called a fragment shader, or a pixel shader, depending on what source you're reading, and that's responsible for doing things like looking up the texture color, mixing it with the triangle's color, doing that kind of thing, and finally outputting a color for the screen. Together, they form a shader program, and this is what you bind when you're drawing things like meshes. Now, I'll cover some quick terminology. As with any program, there are a few ways to set up parameters or customize a shader program. You might have two different meshes, both with the same shader program, but given different parameters to get different results. There's kind of global parameters, or in WebGL terms, these are called uniforms. And if you think about a shader program consisting of both a vertex and fragment shader, uniforms are things you set globally and are available in either. Imagine on the first mesh, for example, you might set a uniform called diffuse texture with one texture, and on the second one, you might set a different texture. Then there are attributes, and these you don't really set yourself. They're part of the mesh data itself and are only accessible via the vertex shader. This gives the vertex shader the chance to do any manipulation of the data, including transforming the position of each vertex. Lastly, we have varyings. And this is like a communication pipe between the vertex shader and the fragment shader. They're slightly difficult to understand, so I'll step through a basic example. Say you have this triangle here with three vertices. At each of these three vertices, the GPU is going to run your vertex program, which will transform and output positions. Let's say that each vertex also outputs a varying. So at vertex 1, we'll output a color value of 100, or red. At vertex 2, we'll output 010, or green. And at vertex 3, we'll output 001, or blue. Now, this triangle is also made up of a whole bunch of pixels. So let's just pick one at random and look at how the fragment shader works. At every one of these pixels, the GPU will also run the fragment shader. And as you know, it has access to the uniform values, but it also has access to the varying values from the vertex shader. So this pixel is part of the triangle formed by these three vertices. And those three vertices provided three different varying values. What happens is those values will get interpolated across the triangle, and the fragment shader at any given pixel will get the interpolated value. OK, so we're all set. Let's code this up. In 3JS, your main entry point to getting your own custom shaders going is by using this class here called Shader Material. And we can take a quick look at the docs here. As it mentions here, it's a material designed to be rendered with custom shaders. There's some other info here about gotchas and things to consider, mostly minor things that probably won't affect us. I'm just going to scroll down the page to the section on using the Shader Material class. So from the example here, usage is straightforward. You need to supply three things. A chunk of code representing the fragment shader, a chunk of code representing the vertex shader, and a dictionary of uniform values that you have to supply. And keep in mind, these are just the custom ones you declare. There's also a whole bunch of built-in ones. If I scroll down a bit and I click on this WebGL program link, WebGL program declares a whole bunch that 3GS kind of magically just sets for you without you needing to worry about supplying them. Here's a complete list. You can see here that the vertex shader has a bunch that are usually important for transforming positions and normals. So you've got the worldview and projection matrices, as well as a combined one, just to save you from having to multiply them yourselves in the shader. 
You've got a couple others here that can be useful like normal matrix and camera position. You've also got some attributes that you don't have to declare yourself. Things like position, normal, and UV are declared for you if you use shader material. The code to declare these is concatenated onto your code before it's all compiled, so it's all there. Down a bit further, you can see that the fragment shader also has a couple of uniforms that you can access if you need them. Now as a small aside, you can also use raw shader material, the other way to define custom shaders in 3GS. It won't add any built-in uniforms and attributes, you just get exactly what you wrote. Let's code some examples up. We'll create a new directory for this shader project. We'll call it 3GS Tutorial Shaders. Once that's done, I'm going to copy a previous project in here because I don't feel like writing all the boilerplate to get started. So a quick copy of the basic 3D world project should get us going. If you haven't had a chance to check that out, go now since it explains all of the setup. Anyway, once that's done, we're in the code here and I'm going to define a few basic objects in the scene. I'll start with two spheres and a ground plane. So we already have a ground plane from the project. What I need to do now is define two spheres. And that's pretty easy. All you have to do is instantiate a three dot mesh and as a parameter you need to pass in a sphere geometry and a material. I'm going to set the material color to white to start. We also need to make sure to set the position. So I've set it using position.set and I'll make this first sphere a little bit down to the left on the x-axis. Lastly, just add it to the scene. Now a quick copy paste of this chunk of code so that we can make a second sphere and I'll reuse all of the same parameters for now, white material, blah blah blah. Only difference is I'm going to set this one a little bit to the right on the x-axis. So now we've got this simple scene ready to try some shaders out. As you can see, we've got two spheres and a ground plane. Back in the code, I'm going to go to the second sphere here and this is what we're going to change to our own material. So the second parameter, the one that's mesh standard material, it's getting swapped for shader material. And now we need to pass in a few params. So I'm going to pass in an empty uniforms, and then I'm going to pass some stuff in for the fragment and vertex shaders. And although I haven't written these out yet, I'll just supply two names, and of course we'll go and define them afterwards. Often I find it's easier to write the code as if things exist, and then go back and actually make them exist. So let's scroll to the top here, and what I'll do is define both vertex shader and fragment shader. If you're not familiar with GLSL, I suggest finding and reading some tutorials on it. It's a simple language, very C-like, vector types mostly. But if you're familiar with JavaScript, you can probably get the gist of what I'm writing here. What I'm doing is transforming the point from local space by the worldview projection matrices. The vertex shader is super simple, not doing anything else. The fragment shader is going to be equally simple. All that I'll do here is define the main, and then we'll output a constant color. So that means that I just need to assign a vec4 to glfrag color, and I'll make this output red to begin with, which is 1, 0, 0, and 1 for the alpha. And that should be it. Load this up, and what do you know? Red sphere on the right, left one is the same as before. But what's interesting here is that the red sphere, it's actually running our custom shader. We can literally put anything into that code, and it'll show up on the sphere. I'll run through a few more quick examples, so let's go back into the code, and we're going to modify the vertex shader a bit just to show what can be done here. So let's take the sphere, and what I'm going to do is multiply the x-axis by 4, stretching the whole thing out. So we need to multiply the incoming position by 411 before we apply the rest of the transform. When I load that up, look how stretched out this is. What I'm showing you is that these shaders can modify both the final color that's emitted or the actual mesh itself can be mutated programmatically. Let's go and undo that now because we don't really need it. But I'll give you an example of a varying attribute that you pass through from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. What I'm going to do is pass the spheres normal through the varying attribute. So I just need to declare a new varying, we can call it vnormal, and inside the main function we need to assign the normal to the varying. Now we make the same modification to the fragment shader, so we scroll down here and just do the same thing, declare a new varying called vnormal, and it's important they have the same name. Now we can just use it however we want inside the fragment shader. In this case, I'm going to replace the color output with the normal, meaning we're going to visualize the normals. So just assign it to glfrag color. Also notice, since glfrag color is a vec4, we need to turn vnormal into a vec4 from a vec3. Okay, load this up, and it's kind of colorful. What you're seeing is a visual representation of the normal directions. If you were to pick any color on the sphere, write out the values, you'd get a unit vector representing the normal. 
Quick pro tip, I've spent years as a professional graphics programmer on major Xbox PlayStation games, and often when I'm debugging things that have gone wrong in shaders, I may output the colors directly like I'm doing here, to visualize them and see where things might have gone wrong. Okay, last cheesy demo. Let's create a uniform that we'll set from code. First thing, we'll comment out the GL frag color lines since we don't want to visualize the normals anymore, and we'll declare a new VEC4 uniform at the top. Let's call it sphere color. We'll also change the code so that we output sphere color directly into GL frag color. Now to actually set it from code. We need to go over to the declaration of the shader material, and you see that uh, we had a uniforms dict here before, but it was an empty dict since we had nothing to add. But now we're going to define a new one, so we need to add it here. You just need to add a key value with the same name. So it was called sphere color in the fragment shader, so we called it sphere color here. And we'll set the value to blue, so instantiate a new 3.vector3 and give it value 001. That should be good to go. Load it up and we're seeing a blue sphere. But you don't have to just set the value once and forget about it. You can set it every frame if you want. What we can do is add a quick variable. Let's call this total time. And we'll use this to accumulate some time in the step function. So let's go down to the step function. What we'll do is change the color over time. So first we need to accumulate the time in total time. And once we've done that, we can run it through a sign function. What this will do is over time, the value will bounce back and forth between negative one and one. And then we just need to use it for something. Also note, since the sign value gives a range of negative one to one, you have to multiply by 0 0.5 and add 0 0.5 just to put it in the range zero to one. So let's declare two colors here. We'll just call them C1 and C2, and we're just going to set these to red and green respectively. Now, 3JS allows you to use either a 3.color or a 3.vector3. I'll use a 3.vector3 since I already used that previously. Then we'll create an interpolated value by creating a third variable, which is just lerping between C1 and C2 using the value we computed. Next, I just access the uniform value from the material and assign it there. That's all it takes to update a value, and we should be able to see it live. Now if you load this up, the color ping pongs back and forth between red and green. And that's it. That should get you started. Obviously, there's a lot more to writing shaders, and if you're looking for ideas of effects or cool things you can do, I heartily recommend visiting a site like ShaderToy, because it's just absolutely full of good ideas. Code's all up on GitHub, so check it out if you're stuck or just want to look it over. Otherwise, until next time, cheers.